Well, good evening. Thank you all for coming back. Please take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Acts chapter 20. Acts 20. Verse 28 through 31 is our scripture reading, and we're going to look, uh, be looking at a lot of different passages. I'll just be reading them to you. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 through 31. This is God's word. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert and remember that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Let's pray, please. Father, we're so thankful for the work of Great men of God like Jay Gresham Machen, a man who had great intellectual gifts, a man of tremendous love for the word of God and for the gospel, for the truth, and yet a man who was also flawed and who had sin in his life. But we're thankful for the stand that he took 100 years ago against the rise of liberalism, and we're seeing it again today. Our children and grandchildren will fight the same battles. Help us to be vigilant. Help us to learn what we can from the things that men like Machen got right, and to see him as a doorman to the word of God, as someone whose feet that we ought to sit at and learn from, as he loved the scriptures and loved the Christian faith and loved the true gospel. So we pray that you would bless us now as we see what we can gain from his life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Biblical lessons from the life of J. Gresham Machen. Uh, a member of the congregation uh, asked me if I would do a podcast or maybe a sermon uh, to summarize what, what I learned, what the main takeaways were from the conference, because they said they didn't want to listen to seven and a half hours of lectures. So I'm going to condense seven and a half hours of lectures into a sermon for you. The winter conference down there at Reformation Bible College, January the 16th, and I actually didn't know they did an annual winter conference, and uh, I think I'm going to make an annual event out of that. It's always a Good excuse to drive to Florida in January. It was a wonderful conference, and I went back and listened to a couple of the talks, and I've searched my memory banks for the mental notes I was trying to make throughout that intensive day. And so I want to take this message this evening and share 10 biblical lessons that we can learn from the life and ministry and books and writings of J. Gresham Machen, specifically his book, Christianity and Liberalism. So biblical lesson number one, hopefully you have a handout. Did everybody get a handout that were out there in the foyer? No, you didn't? Some of you, get, some of you did? Okay. Well, there's a handout with the 10, 10 points on it. The biblical lesson number one, Machen had a heartwarming relationship with his godly, Christian, very understanding, and patient parents. In Proverbs 20, verse 5, counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out, or in this case, a mother of understanding will draw it out. I want to encourage all of you to be patient with those that look to you for advice. Be patient with with those that look to you for counsel. It's good at every point in our lives to have people that pour into us, people who are kind of alongside of us on our same level, and also people that we mentor and we disciple. It was very heartwarming to hear what a wonderful relationship young Machen had with his Christian parents, and they wrote one another many very encouraging letters regularly, and young J. Gresham Machen constantly sought his parents' counsel and advice and very much appreciated and honored their words. He was from a generation that had a greater sense of honor to his elders, to family, to mom and dad than our generations do uh, today. Proverbs 23, 22, listen to your father who begot you. And do not despise your mother when she is old. If you have godly Christian parents, I want to say to you, covenant children, go to them when you've got problems or need advice. And I'll tell you, when crises have come up in my own life, through the years, when things have happened that have been really, really, really hard, the first person I still always call 
is my father. I still call him because I know he loves me and I know he'll give me good advice and I know that he knows me really well. Now, you may not realize this yet, but your parents have a lot more wisdom and experience than you do. A wise Christian man told me that by the time he was 17 years old, he thought his father was the biggest buffoon he'd ever met. And every year after he turned 17, his father somehow got wiser and wiser. What was really happening? Well, that wise Christian man realized that it was he who was the buffoon and that his father was actually really wise the whole time. My experience was similar. And so, Covenant children, I want to encourage you, if you have godly Christian parents, to know that they know you a lot better than you may think. They raised you. They've been watching you your whole life. Seek out their counsel and their advice. They love you, and they'll always want only to help you. One thing I learned about Machen from this conference that I did not know, I'd never heard this before, Machen was very indecisive about going into the ministry. In fact, he told his parents in a letter that as far as he was concerned, going into the ministry was impossible. And Dr. Tweeddale said, this is a great illustration of what happens when you tell God no. Machen loved his parents. He sought their counsel regularly. His mother, Mary Machen, saw her son's indecisiveness about his future uh, clearly in his letter. She saw it. And to this attitude, this godly Christian mother replied to him, quote, I want to assure you, son, that whatever you decide upon, I shall acquiesce in and do my best to help you. You think we would lose faith if we knew what you were up to, but one thing I can assure you of, that nothing you do could, nothing that you could do would keep me from loving you. Nothing, end quote. At this time, young Mason was not only unsure what, did he wanted, what he wanted to do with his life, he wasn't sure about ministry or what, what kind of vocation he wanted to do, his faith in the Bible was also shaken by the liberals that he met when he was studying in Germany. And before that happened, he'd never met a liberal. And he found out they actually were pretty nice guys. And they were well-spoken. And they knew their stuff. And they knew the Bible. And they could quote it. And they, they sounded Christian. His mother saw that her son was having a crisis of faith as well. And that he was struggling to believe. Not only was he indecisive, what should I do with my life? He wasn't sure if the Bible was true now. And she wrote this to him, quote, It is easy enough to grieve me. Perhaps I worry too much. But my love for my boy is absolutely indestructible. In the meantime, she says to her son, listen to this. In the meantime, get all the good and all the fun, too, out of your present circumstances, end quote. I love it. She knows her son is a very bright, intellectual, very serious-minded young man. And she also knows he needs to chill out a little. He needs to enjoy himself a little bit. He needs to enjoy and have fun in his present circumstances. He needs to loosen up a little bit. Yes, be serious about the things of God and, and about knowing Scripture and about loving people. Yes, be serious about that, but enjoy God's gifts too. Remember John Calvin wrote, quote, We are nowhere forbidden to laugh or to be satisfied with food or to be delighted with music or to drink wine, end quote. These are God's gifts to us and examples of God's liberality towards us. Machen's mother knew that. She knew what he was like. She knew he was a bit too serious at times. And so she tells him, have fun. Son, enjoy yourself. She exemplified Proverbs 20, verse 5. She knew how to draw out her son. And she knew what was in the deep water of his heart. Having people that really know you and love you is such a blessing in the Christian church. It really is. And so let us as parents and as children, as friends... Let's strive to know one another so we can do that, so we can draw out the very best in one another. She gives him good counsel. She tells him she loves him and always will, but also encourages him to have a good time in this season of your young life. Parents, we ought to encourage our children to enjoy life in addition to the discipleship that we're trying to do in their lives. Enjoy yourself. Have fun. Machen was very reluctant to go into any kind of ministerial service. And when he started teaching Greek, at Princeton Seminary, started his first professorial role there, he wrote to his mother, quote, that no one ever began a work with more misgivings than I have, end quote. He's very reluctant, very indecisive. He wasn't sure, is this what I really should be doing with my life? Am I, am I really called to do this? 
So that's the first lesson. The first lesson, he had a wonderful relationship with his parents, and it was exactly the way that kind of relationship should be. Second biblical lesson, edifying the whole church, not just other scholars and academics, was his great burden in all his preaching and in all of his writing. Now, this is a guy that wrote a textbook in Greek. He wrote a textbook on learning biblical Greek. Okay, so this guy was a scholar to be sure, but the things that he wrote, the books that he wrote, his preaching ministry, the things that he did, it was for the whole church. He had a burden for the lay people. He wasn't just trying to impress other academics. 1 Corinthians 14, 12 says, Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. And someone that's of, only, that's only of any use to other academics, well, well, what good are they to the people of God? The edification of the church, that was the goal that this man had in his academic life, in his church life, in his books, and in his preaching and teaching. I'm thankful for the great scholarly works that some people write, but being a great scholar and being able to communicate complex truth to the vast numbers of Christians who have not been to Bible college and seminary, that is a rare gift. And that's something that Machen had. You know who else had that gift? R.C. Sproul did too. A real gift to take the complex and to make it understandable for us. There are many people like that in, in the church today, and we should be thankful for them. Although Machen was a keen, world-class scholar, his great burden was the common people, the churchgoers and local churches. His books were written for them. You need to know that. Christianity and liberalism, he didn't write that for academics. He wrote it for lay people. He wrote that book so people would understand the issues. His little book, What is Faith? One of the best books I've ever read. He wrote it for you and for me. And his, his book, I actually just got, just started reading, God Transcendent. Another book he wrote for lay people. Among others, among many other things he wrote, they were written for not scholars, but regular Christian people. Great mental and intellectual gifts are wonderful, but as scripture teaches, let those special gifts be exercised for the edification of the church. Okay, third lesson, third biblical lesson. Uh, this, is a, this is a fault. This is the only fault that was uh, brought forward about Machen. Machen opposed racial integration at Princeton Seminary in 1913. I did not know this about him. He was a Southern Presbyterian, and this was a blind spot for him. He opposed his, uh, his mentor, B.B. Warfield's desire to integrate black people into Princeton Seminary. Machen was against that. And the statements that I've seen from him are wrong, and it was a sin on his part. I'd never heard that before, and I was very disappointed to hear that. But thankfully, Machen's older, wiser mentor, B.B. Warfield, was in favor of racial integration. But what a blind spot. Racism is such a terrible sin. There's only the human race. There are ethnicities, and people often look different in terms of the shapes of their eyes and their skin color, etc. But every human being on earth, no matter what they look like, are descendants of the same two people. There's Adam and Eve. We're not different evolutionary trajectories of ape-like hominids. But God built tremendous genetic variety into the human genome, and therefore people can look very, very different from one another. But we're all exactly the same in that we're all made in God's image. And we're all sinful, and we all need Jesus Christ. We all have a biological sex that was assigned to us at birth. At, not birth, but at conception. The text of Scripture is explicit. Every human being descended from Adam and Eve. Acts 17, 26, he has made from, from one every nation of men to dwell on the face of all the earth. And people from time to time still ask me, occasionally I get emails and people ask me, what do you think of inter interracial marriage? And uh, I'll ask, what do you mean by interracial marriage? And they'll say, what do you think about blacks marrying whites? Most are informed, are shocked when I inform them, I've never met a black or a white person in my life. That's white. You see me? Whatever I am, I'm not white. Peach, beige, okay, I don't tan, I just turn red when the sun hits me. But there's brown people, there's olive-colored people, but I've never met a black person or a white person in my life. So there's not any such thing as interracial marriage. People have different skin color, different melanin content in their skin pigmentation. It was pretty remarkable to hear that Machen was opposed to racial integration at Princeton Seminary. Thankfully, uh, Warfield uh, had more tenure there. Biblical lesson number four, Christianity and liberalism are opposing religions. Christianity and liberalism are opposing religions. Liberalism, 
we learned from the conference and what Machen could see, liberalism was based on philosophical naturalism and denies God's supernatural intervention in the world. Now, what is philosophical naturalism? What is that? It's the same idea that dominates today that there is no God and the laws that govern nature never go out of their course. Therefore, Christianity is not a religion of supernatural redemption because there is nothing beyond nature. It's just reduced to being a way of life. Christianity becomes, in liberalism, just a, a way to live your life. That's all it is. Christianity is a life, not a doctrine. Christianity is not a set of doctrines, according to the liberals. It is merely an ethical system that governs human behavior. And so it's not a set of doctrines uh, when, which, when believed by the grace of God, results in a way of life. Now, the liberals then and now still do not get this. In John 8, 32, Jesus said, You will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Well, free in what way? Free from slavery to sin. Free to walk in newness of life. Without the truth, nobody will be set free. Without the biblical gospel of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, on account of the blood and righteousness of Christ alone, the righteous and godly life we are called to live in this world will never be seen. To be set free from sin, we have to know the one true gospel. And listen, please, and the gospel is doctrine. To be set free from sin, you've got to know the gospel, and the gospel is doctrine. Christianity and liberalism are opposing religions. Biblical lesson number five. What is the duty of Christian officers in the church in times of moral and theological decline? You see it there on your handout. Four things that Machen said we have to do. Number one, we have to defend the gospel. We have to defend the gospel. We cannot equivocate on the gospel. We have to define the truth, what justification is, what sanctification is, what saving faith is, who God is, who Jesus is, what Jesus accomplished at the cross in his life and death and resurrection. And we have to expose error. The word of God teaches that every elder in the church has this duty. Titus 1 verse 9. Every elder is always to be holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. That he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. For there are many insubordinate. I want to encourage you. When you see that phrase in Titus 1.10. There are many insubordinate. What, what is that talking about? That's the liberals. What does it mean to be insubordinate? I will not submit to the authority of God. I won't submit to it. They're insubordinate to the word of God. And that's what the Holy Spirit says to the elders. There are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Who are those of the circumcision? Those that add things to faith in Christ to get you into heaven. Especially those. you got to watch out for them. He says, whose mouths must be stopped who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. Machen's great little book, it's a short book, Christianity and Liberalism, it's a masterpiece of theology. That book, the chapters in the book are chapter one, doctrine, chapter two, God and man, chapter three, the Bible, chapter four, Christ, chapter five, salvation, chapter six, the church. Why is it ordered like that? Because he's defending the entire system of Christian theology from beginning to end. You know why he had to do that? Because the liberals got everything wrong. Everything. They denied what the Bible teaches. They denied what the Christian faith teaches about everything. And so he has to start at the beginning, the importance of doctrine, and then he goes. The Bible, God and man, grace, Christ, salvation, faith, the church. He goes through the whole system of doctrine to defend it. They got everything wrong. One of... Uh, the most important enemies of the faith at the time Machen wrote the book was a fellow named Harry Emerson Fosdick. And he wrote a very famous sermon that he preached called Shall the Fundamentalists Win? I mentioned that to you, um, I think, last Sunday. And it was uh, made very popular and published and printed by the hundreds of thousands by John D. Rockefeller. Now, John D. Rockefeller is usually seen and remembered as being some kind of a devout man. He was not. He was a liberal. He was a liberal and promoted liberalism. And I, I don't think he knew the Lord at all. Anyone that could read Shall the Fundamentalist Win, I encourage you, if you can stomach it, read Shall the Fundamentalist Win by Harry Emerson Fosdick and read it. It is nauseating stuff. Now, in that sermon, I wanted to share with you uh, one thing that Fosdick said about just one doctrine in particular, the virgin birth of Christ. Listen to the way 
this liberal, Harry Emerson Fosdick, talks about the virgin birth. Listen. He says, We may well begin with the vexed and mooted question of the virgin birth of our Lord. This is, this is the liberal. Just remember, this is Fosdick. I know people in the Christian churches, ministers, missionaries, laymen, devoted lovers of the Lord and servants of the gospel who, alike as they are in their personal devotion to the master, hold quite different points of view about a matter like the virgin birth. Okay, now listen to this. Pay attention. Here, for example, is one point of view, that the virgin birth is to be accepted as historical fact, that it actually happened. That's just one point of view, that it happened. And you can think, it didn't happen, and that's okay. Isn't that amazing to you? He says, there was no other way for a personality like the master to come into this world except by a special biological miracle. That is one point of view. And many are the gracious and beautiful souls who hold it. Remember Romans 16, verse 17? Smooth words of flattery. That's exactly what I'm reading to you. He says, but side by side with them, with people that believe it actually happened, side by side with them in evangelical churches is a group of equally loyal and reverent people who would say that the virgin birth is not to be accepted as historical fact. So far from thinking that they have given up anything vital in the New Testament attitude towards Jesus, these Christians remember that the two men who contributed most to the church's thought of the divine meaning of the Christ were Paul and John, who never even distantly allude to the virgin birth, end quote. What, what is he attacking? Scripture. The unity and the authority of Scripture. Why? He has to. He has to. Now, Machen wrote an entire book on the virgin birth of Christ, defending it. In Christianity and Liberalism, listen to Machen's response to Fosdick. He says, the miracle which is usually singled out is the virgin birth, meaning pick, being picked on by the liberals, rejected by the liberals. The liberal preacher insists on the possibility of believing in Christ, no matter which view to be, he adopts as to the manner of his entrance into the world. It is not the person, it is not the, person the same, no matter how he was born, the impression is thus produced upon the plain man that the preacher is accepting the, the main outlines of the New Testament account of Jesus, but merely has difficulties with this particular element in the account. But such an impression is radically false, end quote. And he goes on from there to point out, if you don't believe in the virgin birth of Christ, lo and behold, guess what else they don't believe in? The inspiration of scripture, the resurrection of Christ, the substitutionary atonement, the deity of Christ, the Trinity, the deity of the Holy Spirit, it's not just an isolated thing. I just have trouble with the virgin birth. No, they reject the whole system. And that's why in his book, he defends the whole system of Christian doctrine. God and man, Christ, salvation, the church, the Bible. The, church, the Christian church, those that are called, justified, redeemed by the blood of Christ, who, by the way, was born of a virgin, just FYI. And if he wasn't born of a virgin, we are lost and in our sins and under God's just condemnation. It does matter what theory you hold to. The, the church has to defend sound doctrine with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength because we have to defend the gospel. If we don't have these truths, we don't have the gospel, we don't have hope. Second thing that the church has to do in times of, of doctrinal decline, we have to uphold ordination standards. The church cannot ordain people to the ministry who have no business serving in the church. We can't look for people to lead the church just because they're well-educated, because they're successful in business, because they're smart, because they come from good stock, and they give us hope for the future because they just seem like great people. We can only put those in leadership whom God has called by his spirit. Jesus commissions men to serve in gospel ministry. Anyone serving in leadership who doesn't love the Lord Jesus by loving his truth and the doctrine of scripture and loves their local church, they need to get out of positions of leadership. So much of what we think of in terms of the qualifications of men for ministry, it's just ignored so much today. So much of it is ignored today. The scriptures tell us what qualifies a man for ministry. He has to be the husband of one wife, blameless, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach. And that assumes that he believes what he's teaching. Not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, 
but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a new convert, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. And that phrase, able to teach, is just vital. It assumes a knowledge of the scripture and a conviction that it's true. We can't just lower the bar of who we ordain to get warm bodies into positions of leadership. The standard is as high as it could be. Thirdly, what we have to do during times of, of doctrinal decline, we have to be loyal to Jesus. You have to be loyal to Jesus, and you're loyal to Jesus by being loyal to the Bible, loyal to his word. Do you love the Lord Christ? Do you love the lost? Do you love the glory of, the, of God? Do you love biblical worship? Do you love singing God's praises? Loyalty to Jesus has to be valued above every human relationship. And so often it's not. That was one thing that happened. R.C. Sproul said that during the Evangelicals and Catholics Together document when that whole thing erupted. He said again and again and again, I am learning more and more that we live in a time when people value relationships more than they do truth. They value family relationships. Men protect each other because they're friends. Oh, yeah, he doesn't believe this. He doesn't think that. He owes these weird views of this or that. But, but boy, if you could worship next to him in church, you would see he's such a wonderful, pious man. People value their friendships more than they value the truth. They value family more than they do the truth. We can't do that. Our loyalty has to be to Christ, whatever the cost. Fourthly, under this uh, fifth point, fourth point, we must emphasize Christian education. You know, Machen was a big stickler for that. The Christian school, Christian education. The, the man testified before Congress at the federal level, testified against the formation of the Department of Education because he thought it was evil for us to have a Department of Education. You know what? He was right. In the home, at church, we have to teach the Bible and the doctrines of the Bible. All the Bible must be taught for all the people all the time. These are the duties of church officers at all times, but especially in times of doctrinal indifference, doctrinal decline, and apostasy from the truth. All right, number six. We must have the greatest concern when we see doctrinal decline and indifference. We must have the greatest concern when we see doctrinal decline and and indifference. And I just read to you from Acts 20, verse 28 through 31, that little church there in Ephesus. Paul warned the Ephesian elders. You see the passage there, Acts 20, 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves, this is Paul exhorting them, and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this. After my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch, all elders in the church, watch. And remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. What an amazing thing. He warned the members of that church with tears rolling down his face. Man, when I, when I, I'm really worried when I leave, savage wolves are going to rise up among you. Men that you know are going to stand up and call for compromise and call for making concessions on this point and that point and everything else. Doctrinal decline happens when leaders equivocate the truth. What does that mean? It means they vacillate. They waver. They say they affirm Christ. They affirm the Bible. They affirm faith. They affirm the gospel. They affirm justification but they redefine those terms rather than submitting to the teaching of Scripture. They'll say all the right words, use the right expressions, quote Scripture. They'll sound orthodox, but we know they're redefining the key terms, and they don't mean what the Christian church and what the Bible means by them. That's what doctrinal decline is all about. Machen saw it. We're seeing it today. We must hold fast to the faithful word, says Machen, quote, Yet there is in the Christian life no room for despair. We must hold fast the faithful word. Only our hopefulness should not be founded on the sand. It should be founded not upon a blind ignorance of the danger, but solely upon the precious promises of God. And listen to Machen. Laymen as well as ministers should return in these trying days with new earnestness to the study of the word of God. If the word of God be heeded, the Christian battle will be fought both with love and with faithfulness. Party passions and personal animosities will be put away. 
But on the other hand, even angels from heaven will be rejected if they preach a different gospel from the blessed gospel of the cross. Every man must decide upon which side he will stand. God grant that we may decide aright. End quote. Our forefathers, like Mason, they wrote, they wrote, wrote stirring stuff. I know I say that a lot, but they did. Lesson number seven. Please hear this one. Calls for rethinking the doctrines of the faith and calls for pragmatic compromise for the sake of, indifferent, or of influence are nothing new. Calls to rethink things. When you hear the word, let's rethink the gospel. Let's, let's rethink the doctrine of God. I would encourage you to turn around and run as fast as you can in the other direction. When savage wolves dressed up as sheep call for rethinking settled Christian truths and then they play the martyr when they're called out for their false teachings, you need to know that's very, very, very common. That's nothing new. Deny the Christian faith in the name of New truth from the word of God. We're breaking out new truth from the word of God. You know what group said that? The Federal Vision. We're breaking out new truth from the word of God. Did they break out new truth? No, they just revived old heresy. That's all. Nothing they said was new. They broke out nothing new from the word of God. Everything they said has been said before and refuted before and rejected before. Calls for rethinking the doctrines of the faith and calls for pragmatic compromise for the sake of influence are not new. 1933, 1933, that's 90 years ago, there was a major publication of six major Christian denominations on rethinking missions. Can anyone guess what their grand conclusion was? After all these years and gathering all this data and rethinking missions, here's their grand conclusion, what they published in 1933. Here's what we all need to do for the sake of missions. Forget theology and doctrine and preaching. What is the essence of missions? Education and welfare. Wow, that's shocking. Is that new? No. Today we have Rick Warren, author of one of the best-selling books in history, The Purpose Driven Life, saying what we need today more than anything is a new reformation of deeds, not creeds. Is that new? Just know this, dear congregation. Listen, please. The basis for abandoning theology and abandoning our confessions and abandoning doctrinal precision is always a pragmatic one. It always is. So we can have more influence. This is the pride of man. Men really think, they really think man doesn't need redemption from sin. He just needs better education and welfare. Machen said this. Listen to this. Machen called that attitude. He called it paganism listen to him he says quote paganism is that view of life which finds the highest goal of human existence in the healthy and harmonious and joyous development of existing human faculties that's paganism mason goes on very different is the christian ideal paganism is optimistic with regard to unaided human nature's human nature whereas christianity is the religion of the broken heart in saying that Christianity is the religion of the broken heart, we do not mean that Christianity ends with the broken heart. We do not mean that the characteristic Christian attitude is a continual beating on the breast or a continual crying of, woe is me. Nothing could be further from the fact. On the contrary, Christianity means that sin is faced once for all and then is cast by the grace of God forever into the depths of the sea. The trouble with the paganism of ancient Greece, as with the paganism of modern times, was not in the superstructure, which was glorious, but in the foundation, which was rotten. There was always something to be covered up. The enthusiasm of the architect was maintained only by ignoring the disturbing fact of sin. In Christianity, on the other hand, nothing needs to be covered up. The fact of sin is faced squarely, once for all, and is dealt with by the grace of God. But then, after sin has been removed by the grace of God, the Christian can proceed to develop joyously every faculty that God has given him. Such is the higher Christian humanism, a humanism founded not upon human pride, but upon divine grace. End quote. Isn't that awesome? 
right on the money. So when you hear calls to rethink, or in modern times, what was the, they didn't use the word rethink, but revoice. We need to give a new voice to the LGBT crowd and community. Remember, we submitted a prayer request to our whole church. We, we asked that you pray that the PCA not form a study committee to study that issue. Because we knew if they studied it, what are they going to come back with? Compromise. What did they come back with? Compromise. Do you really need to study that issue? Do we really need to rethink that issue? No, sin is still sin. It's like, it's like forming a study committee. Is it still wrong to steal? Yeah, it's still wrong to steal. Do we really need to waste hundreds of hours and thousands of dollars on figuring that out? No. Eighth lesson. The central importance of the doctrine of God and of all doctrine in general. Machen taught us this. Now, you cannot read the pastoral letters and miss this. 1 Timothy 4, 13, the Holy Spirit speaking here, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. 1 Timothy 4, 16, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. And then some of the last words that the Apostle Paul penned before he lost his life. The last letter he wrote, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 1, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And that happens over and over and over again throughout the rest of church history. Remember from the catechism, question three, what are the two things that, scriptures, that the scriptures teach, scriptures principally teach, what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man? You know what that is? That's doctrine. That's teaching. That's theology. Why does God have to tell us that stuff? Why does God have to tell us what we're supposed to believe about God and what, we're supposed to, what our duties are? Why does he have to tell us that? Because if he doesn't tell us, we're not going to know what they are. We're not going to know what we're supposed to believe about God. Doctrine and the Bible are being ignored. They're being discarded by professing Christians all over America today. The most recent statistics from the Ligonier Survey of Theology, they were profoundly disturbing. I did a whole podcast and highlighted some of the questions and answers. They were just stunning. One of those questions or one of those comments, do you agree or disagree with this? <clears throat> God accepts the worship of all religions. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Now, before we look at the statistics on who agreed and who disagreed with this, you need to know something. Everything's at stake in how you answer that question. Everything's at stake if you agree or disagree with that. Everything. Church life, preaching, evangelism, worship, everything is at stake in that. Now, the United States general population, 67% agreed. God accepts the worship of all religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. Among evangelicals, 58% agreed. 58% agreed with that. We're pluralists. We're a nation of pluralists. And is the church doing a good job leading? Are we leading culture or following it? Evangelicals between the ages of 18 and 34, 64% of them agreed. God accepts the worship of Muslims. Guess we don't need a mediator anymore or a savior. What does the Bible say about this? What was it that upset the Roman world so much? Peter preaching in Acts 4. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus said there's no other way to the Father but through him. The second one even the smallest sin deserves damnation. The general population of America, 25% agreed with that. That's actually, that, that's actually pretty good. I thought it would be lower than that. Among evangelicals, even the smallest sin deserves damnation. 40% agreed with that. Could Machen write a book today called Christianity and Evangelicalism? Because evangelicalism is another religion now. I think in large part he, he could. What's the point of all this information? I, I want to assure you of something. The reason I share all this with you is not so we can go, ha ha, see, we're right as usual. 
smoking our cigars, those Presbyterians always have superior theology, baby. That's not the point. <laughs> it's not. Here's why we need to go through this. We need to ask ourselves, what's our role in helping the church to see that we can't be indifferent to doctrine and theology? What's our role in getting that out there in the world? I'm so thankful that teams go out from our church with the truth, with the true gospel, and talk to people about the true gospel. It's such a blessing. I think in our circles, we're so used to caring about doctrine, and we're so used to knowing the importance of the Bible and the propositions of Scripture, the theology of Scripture, we, we probably don't really see just how much decline is really taking place around us in the Christian world around us. So I, I say we need to leverage and make use of every kind of technology to spread sound doctrine around the world to the church. We must not allow Christianity to be reduced merely to behavior. As one liberal once put it, the goal of Christianity is to make bad men good and to make good men better. Now, rightly understood, that's what will happen, but only if true doctrine is preached, only if the supernatural gospel is proclaimed and Christ is presented virgin-born, substitutionarily dying, being buried and literally rising from the dead in the same body in which he was crucified, and then faith in Christ and repentance being solicited by preachers. To say that Christianity is merely a life or a way of being better as a person is patently false. <clears throat> People still need Christ, everybody. You do. I do. To save us from our sins, from the wrath of God. Jesus doesn't do that without rightly understanding who he is and what he did. That's doctrine. That's theology. The temptation is always there. It's there in our generation. It'll be there for our kids, our grandkids, and after we're gone, the temptation is always there to accommodate. It's always going to be there. To be seen as cool, as popular. It's one of the things uh, Stephen Nichols at the conference said. We all remember if you went to public school in junior high, there was the, the table where the cool kids sat. And uh, most of us, I, I sat somewhere in the nether region, somewhere else. But everybody wanted to sit at the table with the cool kids. And that's what the temptation is. We want to be cool. We want to be seen as popular. We don't want to be seen as weird and off and things like that. Biblical lesson number nine. Here's one I hope you will remember. Please remember this one. Soft, touchy, bleeding heart liberals, unbelievers, and God-haters will be found in every generation, and their cries for tolerance will never cease. From the perverted men of Sodom and Gomorrah who came to Lot's house, Lot comes out of the house and says, Men, do not do this wickedness. What did the men of Sodom say? This man came to sojourn, and he keeps judging us. That was 3,500 years ago. Has anything changed? We say, this is wrong, this is evil, this is sin. Oh, you're judging us. When Greg Johnson was on the uh, radio program on, on Cross Politic, he said, what I hear you guys doing is, is judging your brothers. It's like, do you realize you're quoting the men of Sodom and Gomorrah? This man came to sojourn. He keeps acting like a judge. You're judging. This lot guy is so judgmental. Harry Emerson Fosdick, 100 years ago, he was a bleeding heart liberal. You know what bleeding heart liberal means, right? They win arguments by crying tears, not by arguments. Revoice supporters in the PCA, they're all the same. They don't go to the text of scripture. They tell anecdotes and tear-jerking stories. And you know what? It works. These unbelievers and wolves who masquerade as Christian ministers and who are as bitterly intolerant of any views contrary to their own, they out-fundamentalize the strictest fundamentalists the world's ever seen. And then they play the martyr when they're called out for it. They can't defend their views. They know they can't. They can't go to the Word of God to, to prove their beliefs. So they have a pity party for themselves. And they tell their tear-jerking anecdotes and stories not to evoke rational thought, but pure emotion. They accomplish their goals with tears, not arguments. It's always been their approach. And sadly, it's usually very effective. But I want to say something. That approach will never work. For the thinking, doctrinally grounded Christians who know and love Christ and know and love the Bible and the truth of the Bible. The liberal unbeliever, Harry Emerson Fosdick, said in that sermon, that famous sermon, shall the fundamentalists win? Listen to this, listen to this bleeding heart liberal, this pity party, quote, 
Here in the Christian churches are these two groups of people. And the question which the fundamentalist raises is this. Shall one of them throw the other out? Has intolerance any contribution to make to this situation? Will it persuade anybody of anything? Is not the Christian church large enough to hold within her hospitable fellowship people who differ on points like this and agree to differ until the fuller truth be manifested? Saying, we just differ with our brothers on the virgin birth. Well, 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 what theory of the virgin birth do you hold to? I don't think it happened. Can't we be tolerant enough to allow these wonderful Christian people to be among us? I mean, listen to that. Shall int has intolerance made any contribution to make this situation better? Is not the Christian church large enough to hold within her hospitable fellowship people who differ on points like the virgin birth of Christ and agree to differ until the fuller truth be manifested? The fundamentalists say not. They say the liberals must go. Well, if the fundamentalists should succeed, then out of the Christian church would go some of the best Christian life and consecration of this generation. Multitudes of men and women, devout and reverent Christians who need the church and whom the church needs. End quote. I wrote on my sermon manuscript, oh, barf. <laughs> this cry for tolerance from liberals like Fosdick, it is a sham and a smokescreen. Do not be taken in by this. Do not be taken in by these tear-jerking stories. Our commitment is to Jesus Christ and to the truth. Let people call you an intolerant bigot. That was one of the charges made by ancient Rome against the early Christians. Nero called the Christians, quote, the haters of all mankind. Listen to Machen. This is so insightful. Listen to Machen. He points out well, how hypocritical this really is. Quote, there are doctrines of modern liberalism just as tenaciously and intolerantly upheld as any doctrines that find a place in the historic creeds. Such, for example, are the liberal doctrines of the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. These doctrines are, as we shall see, contrary to the doctrines of the Christian religion, but doctrines they are all the same. And as such, they require intellectual defense. In seeming to object to all theology, the liberal preacher is often merely objection, objecting to one system of theology in the interest of another. And the desired immunity from theological controversy has not yet been attained. Okay, tenthly, finally, we walk by faith, not by sight, in times of great discouragement. When you see doctrinal decline and apostasy on the level that we see it today in America, there's going to be a temptation. We've just got to, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. If you can't beat them, join them. We walk by faith, not by sight. The uncertainty of what was going to happen in the future, it greatly troubled Machen. He wasn't sure where this was going. And it really got to him. It really upset him 100 years ago. We ought to think often on what our actions and what our inactions today will yield 100 years after we're gone. The final paragraphs of the whole book, Christianity and Liberalism, published 100 years ago, 1923. The final paragraphs are very encouraging. I just want to read them to you and then we'll close. It says Machen, what the immediate future may bring, we cannot presume to say. The final result indeed is clear. God has not deserted his church. He has brought her through even darker hours than those which try our courage now. Yet the darkest hour always comes before the dawn. We have today the entrance of paganism into the church in the name of Christianity. But in the second century, a similar battle was fought and won. From another point of view, modern liberalism is like the legalism of the Middle Ages with its dependence upon the merit of man. And another reformation in God's good time will come. But meanwhile, our souls are tried. We can only try to do our duty in humility and in sole reliance upon the Savior who bought us with his blood. The future is in God's hands, and we do not know the means that he will use in the accomplishment of his will. It may be that the present evangelical churches will face the facts and regain their integrity while yet there is time. If that solution is to be adopted, there is no time to lose. 
since the forces opposed to the gospel are now almost in control. It is possible that the existing churches may be given over altogether to naturalism, that men may see that the fundamental needs of the soul are to be satisfied not inside but outside of the existing churches, and that thus new Christian groups may be formed. But whatever solution there may be, one thing is clear. There must be somewhere groups of redeemed men and women who can gather together humbly in the name of Christ to give thanks to him for his unspeakable gifts and to worship the Father through him. Such groups alone can satisfy the needs of the soul. At the present time, there is one longing of the human heart which is often forgotten. It is the deep, pathetic longing of the Christian for fellowship with his brethren. One hears much, it is true, about Christian union and harmony and cooperation, but the union that is meant is often a union with the world against the Lord, or at best a forced union of machinery and tyrannical committees. How different is the true unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? Sometimes, it is true, the longing for Christian fellowship is satisfied, there are congregations, even in the present age of conflict, that are really gathered around the table of the crucified Lord. There are pastors that are pastors indeed, but such congregations in many cities are difficult to find. Weary with the conflicts of the world, one goes into the church to seek refreshment for the soul, and what does one find? Alas, too often, one finds only the turmoil of the world. The preacher comes forward not out of a secret place of meditation and power, not with the authority of God's word permeating his message, not with human wisdom pushed far into the background by the glory of the cross, but with human opinions about the social problems of the hour or easy solutions of the vast problem of sin. Such is the sermon. And then perhaps the service is closed by one of those hymns breathing out the angry passions of 1861. What year was that? That was the year the Civil War started. Which are to be found in the back part of the hymnals. Listen to them. This, I started this quote and it just kept getting longer and longer. I can't, I can't cut off this sentence or this sentence. This sentence. He says, Thus the warfare of the world has entered even the house of God. And sad indeed is the heart of the man who has come seeking peace. Ah, that, that, hits, that hurts. Is there no refuge from strife, he says? Is there no place of refreshing where a man can prepare for the battle of life? Is there no place where two or three can gather in Jesus' name to forget for the moment all those things that divide nation from nation, race from race, to forget human pride, to forget the passions of war, to forget the puzzling problems of industrial strife, and to unite in overflowing gratitude at the foot of the cross? You hear what he's asking? Is there anywhere we can do that in peace? He says, the last, sentence, the last two sentences of the book, if there be such a place then that is the house of God, and that is the gate of heaven. And from under the threshold of that house will go forth a river that will revive the weary world. End quote. And that's the end of the book. He's right. It's going to be, at least in America for a while, little, little enclaves where the Bible still believed, the gospel still taught and preached. It's going to be from under that threshold that a river will flow that will revive the world. May the sovereign Lord of glory grant that there will never cease to be a gospel witness here in this pulpit, in this church, until the day Jesus comes back and brings the battle for truth to a permanent end. But until he returns, we must be vigilant. We have to pray with tears. We have to gird up the loins of our minds and entrust our fortunes and our destinies in this life and the next into his loving hands and providence. And may God and his truth be that which we love and value more than anything in all of creation, including our dearest human relationships. As Luther said, let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. We are 100 years out from Machen's work defending Christianity from liberalism. And here we sit today, loving the same Lord, the same Bible, the same gospel that Machen preached. If the Lord tarries, there will be people just like this gathered 100 years from now doing exactly the same thing. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord and God, thank you for the work of Machen, and but more importantly, as he, he would say, the work of your holy word. 
that if we're faithful to it, the battle's already won. We trust you for the future. We pray you'd help us to walk by faith, not by sight, and to simply trust that.